My name is Annie Rogers, and on behalf of the Attitude team, I'm pleased to welcome you today to our ADHD experts presentation titled The Healthy Habits Playbook, How to Make Meaningful Changes Actually Stick. Uh, many individuals with ADHD tell us at Attitude that they feel more focused, more productive, uh, more healthy when they stick to a reliable routine. Better yet, if that routine is filled with healthy habits. Uh, of course, easier said than done, which is why we are here today for this webinar with Michelle Novotny, a PhD. Michelle is an internationally recognized expert in the field of ADHD. She's the former president and CEO of the National Attention Deficit Disorder Association, ADA, uh, an inspiring speaker, best-selling author, psychologist, coach, and the parent of a young adult with ADHD. She's also the author of Adult ADHD and What Does Everybody Else Know That I Don't? Today, Michelle will help us evaluate our current habits, replace ones that are just not working, and utilize proven techniques for solidifying and sticking to new habits. Before I hand over the microphone to Michelle, I have just a few housekeeping items. Um, first of all, if you are tuned into the live webinar, you can download the slides um, anytime by clicking on the event resources section of the webinar screen. And if you're interested in the certificate of attendance option, please keep an eye out for instructions in an email you will receive about an hour after we wrap up the live broadcast. If you're listening in replay or podcast mode, just visit attitudemag.com, search for podcast 361 to access the slides, webinar replay, certificate of attendance option. And of course, if you support what we're doing here at Attitude, we hope you will visit attitudemag.com slash subscribe and sign up for Attitude Magazine. Uh, finally, we do have a sponsor for this week's webinar and that is Inflow. Inflow is the number one app to help you manage your ADHD. Developed by leading clinicians, Inflow is a science-based self-help program based on the principles of cognitive behavioral therapy. Click the link in the webinar slides to download Inflow now on the App Store or Google Play Store. Attitude thanks its sponsors for supporting our webinars. Um, sponsorship has no influence on speaker selection or webinar content. So now we have all that out of the way. Michelle, thank you so much for joining us in this um, very important and useful presentation. Hey, thank you very much. And uh, again, so sorry, we're having storms here. So I apologize for the delay. Um, all right, so we're gonna be talking today about habits um, the benefit of habits, how to make a, an activity that you want a habit, and how to keep a habit. Um, so I'd like to start with a little bit of a different perspective on habits. Um, and I want to talk about spoons. And uh, you'll see where that's going in a minute. Uh, so in a number of different fields, especially in physical illnesses, uh, they use metaphors like how many spoons you have to sort of show how much energy somebody has to do something. So for people with lupus or fibromyalgia, um, it's hard to see that they don't have energy uh, because it's an invisible kind of disability. So one of the ways that someone found uh, to explain it would be talking about how many spoons you start out the day with and then how many spoons it takes uh, to do different activities. And that helps explain that. Um, so moving on, um, so if we're talking about ADHD, instead of units of physical energy, um, we could talk about focused mental energy instead. Uh, because again, for people with ADHD, it often takes a lot more effort to do something. And they tend to start off with less spoons than other people. So here we go. So if we were gonna use an example, of somebody without ADHD might start their day off with 150 spoons. So if we're talking about regular people, um, that's what they get. If you're talking about an individual, say with ADHD or with a physical disability, they may only start out their day with 25 spoons. So they start out with very limited resources. And if you have ADHD, you know how much time, energy, and effort it takes to pay attention to something 
and stick with it. Um, it's very, very hard. Um, so then we have the factor, not only do you start out with less spoons, then we have the cost. Uh, and many of the individuals I worked with through counseling or coaching would talk about how exhausted they were by the time they even just started their day. Um, because for many people, you know, and again, the non-ADHD cost might be one spoon to get up, get dressed, get fed, and get out the door. For somebody with ADHD, all of a sudden, each one of those tasks can create uh, an incredible cost, um, you know, because again, you're looking for where did I put this and um, where is that? And oh no, I have nothing to eat. So all of a sudden, something that is automatic uh, becomes very expensive for an individual with ADHD. So we have a double whammy here. One, you start off with less spoons than uh, individuals without ADHD. And second, you cost more to do activities. So things that other people barely pay attention to cost you a great deal. Um, so you can see that it's very hard to be productive and get as much done. And again, I've worked with a number of people over the years with ADHD, and they were like, why can't I just do what everybody else does? Why does it take me so long? Why am I so exhausted? So basically the answer is your spoons. It, you don't have as many spoons and it costs more uh, to do things. So this is where habits are going on. So again, thank you for bearing with me with spoons, um, but I think it's a really worthwhile image because if you have something that becomes automatic, a habit, it actually costs fewer spoons. So a habit is something you do over and over again that tends to happen subconsciously, automatically, very little effort. Uh, so the more activities we can put into the habit compartment, the more energy and resources we have to do other things. Um, so again, habits are really critical for individuals with ADHD because everything is going to be so expensive and using up their resources. So the more resources we can conserve, uh, the more productive and happy and less tired people are going to be. So if you have a task that tends to cost you a lot of spoons right now, um, if we could automate that and have some of those tasks become habits, then we decrease the dread, we decrease the cost, we increase the energy, we increase the self-esteem. So for individuals with ADHD, having behaviors become a habit or automatic is extra critical. Um, because of the cost of things that are not habits. So let's take something like morning, um, because some people actually get up and they have their clothing laid out, they have their breakfast planned and ready in the fridge, lunches are packed, um, everything they need for the day is all there, whether it's in a briefcase, a backpack or whatever, um, cell phone keys, wallet, pocketbook all in the same place, they grab it and go. Um, I'm thinking that some of you may have some challenges in some of those areas. Um, but again, all those behaviors can actually be habits. Uh, for many of the individuals I work with, uh, deciding what to wear can be very stressful because again, one of the things I love about ADHD is all the expansive thinking. One of the things that creates problems with ADHD is all that expansive thinking. Um, because instead of you know, limiting your choices, all of a sudden it's like, oh, this could go with this. Oh, this could go with this. Oh, I need this. And all of a sudden a simple task or a seemingly simple task like getting dressed has all these possibilities. Then you have, is it clean? <laughs> you know, and where did I put this uh, pair of shoes I'm looking for? or where is this tie I know that I wanted. So that simple task like getting dressed for most people can become a whole big thing for people with ADHD and cost a lot of spoons. Then if we move on to you know, getting food, whether it be uh, you know, breakfast, for many individuals with ADHD, they may have a hard time finding what it is they wanna eat, what they feel like they're in the mood for. 
And then it's, do I have those ingredients? Did I buy the banana in the cereal? Oh no, my milk's not good today. I have to come up with something else. So all of a sudden there's this whole big scramble um, for an activity that actually is very predictable and happens every single day. Uh, but for many individuals with ADHD, because of all the possibilities, it suddenly becomes a much bigger task. And again, cost many more spoons. Um, add to it lunches. Uh, again, many options, many possibilities, might not have all the planning and prep ahead. Uh, finding supplies for the day, uh, you know, again, papers don't always end up in the same place. When I do coaching, a lot of times we talk about landing pads and launch pads, you know, putting something in the same place every day when you come home so that when you go to take off, you know where it is. Um, so again, for ADHD, developing one habit, like having a landing pad, um, critical for decreasing stress and saving you a ton of spoons. Um, finding your car keys. Again, many people uh, have a hard time remembering where they put their car keys. They put them in unusual spots. Again, a space for where the car keys goes eliminates a lot of that stress. And again, these things can become habits. Uh, which is what we're going to be talking about. Uh, food. Food's another area that causes many individuals a lot of stress. Um, again, without ADHD, there's a number of people who actually think about what they want to make, and they do meal planning at the beginning of each week, and then they coordinate their shopping to go along with what they want planned to eat. Uh, and then sometimes they make adjustments to the plan after they've shopped. Um, and for many people, they have automatic things, so they don't have to decide from an infinite number of possibilities. Like they might have pizza every Friday night. Uh, they might have meatloaf on Mondays. They might have Chinese food on Wednesdays. Um, but again, they don't make every single decision um, limitless. Uh, so again, there's a lot of guide rails up to again, cost people way less spoons. Um, and this is a real big saver for a lot of people. Um, a lot of people put all the ingredients out they need before they start cooking, and they put them all on one side, and then as they use them, they put them on the other side. Again, all these things would create less stress, less trauma, um, and cost less spoons. For many individuals I work with, again, thinking about what to make for the next meal often is made just in time. It's five o'clock, you hit the house, and all of a sudden, it's like, wow, what am I going to make? And then you start rummaging through cabinets to see what you have in the refrigerator. And you may even start making something and then realize you don't have something. Um, the unique perspective with ADHD is often seen every day as a unique possibility, um, a novel starting point, uh, which, again, is a wonderful trait for ADHD. I love the expansive thinking and expansive problem solving. But in terms of creating and maintaining habits, it's a nightmare. Um, you know, and even for individuals with ADHD, wondering if you put something in, if you didn't put something in, whereas a simple habit, like always putting all the ingredients to the left and then moving them to the right before you start. Um, it's a simple habit, um, but again, it can save a lot of stress. So, you know, when you look at physical activities like exercising, a lot of people have habits around exercising. You know, I don't know what your life looks like, um, but do you hope that sometime you can get some exercising in and you're going to scooch it in um, when you have time? Um, you know, do you have your exercise clothing clean and ready to go, even in the car? Um, you know, do you have a time scheduled in your day to exercise? Do you lay out clothing the night before, keep your bag packed and in the car? Again, these simple habits of scheduling a time to exercise, uh, putting your materials you need in your car ahead of time, again, increase the likelihood that you're actually going to exercise. And again, these things can become habits. So the basic premise would be saving spoons. Uh, so, you know, you might want to equate it to saving money. And the more you can automate your routines and parts of your routines and lock in some of these habits, the less stress you'll become. Um, and again, this is absolutely critical. It's 
critical to automate choices, to automate behaviors, to make your life way less stressful. Um, so again, equate it to money. Um, or for our purposes today, we're talking about spoons. Let's see how many spoons we can save you. Um, because again, your spoons are more precious than other people's spoons and things cost you more spoons. So again, we wanna automate as much as possible so that you can get more accomplished. Now, many individuals with ADHD, when I start to talk about habits, cringe. And they're like, oh, I can't do a habit. I try and then I fail all the time. Um, but what you don't realize is you actually already have habits. They may not be the best of habits. They may not be working well for you, but you actually have things that you do habitually. Um, you know, in the morning, do you always make a cup of coffee or tea and drink it first? Do you brush your teeth before you go downstairs? Um, you know, you have some habits already about that. When you come home from work, do you plop, plop down and uh, just rest for a few minutes? Um, whatever it is, you actually have habits. And even some of those behaviors we talked about that are costly, those might be your current habits. Um, you know, when you think about what habits do you already have in terms of food and food prep? What habits do you already have in terms of organization? You know, your habit might be to look at the mail and put it in a pile. Um, again, many folks with ADHD are amazing pilers, uh, but sometimes the system breaks down and, you know, it's hard to find that special piece of paper uh, that you put in the special pile. Um, so again, you already have habits. It's just some of the habits you have may not be best for you or working for you. They could be part of the costing you stress. So um, there's a, in counseling and psychology, there's a therapy called reality therapy. And the basis of reality therapy asks a simple question. How's that working for you? You know, whatever it is, you know, how's your current habit working for you? You know, not laying out clothes ahead of time. How's that working for you? Not checking ingredients before you start making something. Not having a landing pad or a launch pad. Um, any of those things, it's important to evaluate. You already have a habit, but is it, is it a habit you wanna keep? Or can you save spoons by replacing the habit? So I'd like for you to think quickly, what are two current habits you, that you have right now that are working well for you. Um, and again, if you're coming to this webinar, it seems that you should be a person who's interesting in bettering yourself um, and you know, doing some of the self-help things. Uh, and perhaps you're already working with a coach or a psychologist. Uh, so think about two things that you're currently doing automatically that's working pretty well for you. And now I'd like you to switch and think about two habits that you currently have that cost you considerable stress. You know, is it looking for your keys? Is it looking for your pocketbook? Is it trying to figure out what you're gonna cook for dinner? Um, but think about two current habits that cause you considerable stress right now. And then you might be wanting to keep these in mind as we talk about how to set up a habit and then how to maintain a habit. So this way you're thinking about your life. The important part here is to do the shift from being reactive to being proactive. Um, you know, what can you do that makes a task go well um, that thereby can cost you fewer spoons, fewer units of energy? And what do you currently do that makes things go haywire sometimes causes you and your family a ton of stress and cost you a lot of spoons. Um, and again, we all have different things that we do that help us do things well. And we all have things that we do um, that often make things go haywire or are very costly for us. So if we can develop a habit, a habit actually helps us to be proactive versus reactive. Um, because with the habit, we're already setting up our intention. What is it that we want to do? In addition, many tasks actually repeat themselves and can be automated because we know they're coming. 
I remember I had one gal in, uh, we were working on her doing her business reports. And oh my goodness, she was so stressed about it. And uh, she had to create this whole response. And so we got through that. Well, the next month, about the same time, she was so stressed because she had this report she had to do. And so she was starting from scratch and there we went. So by the third month I had caught on and it's like, wait a minute, isn't this the same report that we did the past two months? And she's like, yeah, it's like, so is this like a monthly report? And she went, um, I guess so. And then it's like, well, are they asking for the same kinds of information? And then we looked and here it was a monthly report it was a formula. Basically, they wanted to know these certain figures, the certain information. So we created a template that she could use to fill in. So instead of being surprised every month, uh, she got in the habit of jotting down the information that she knew she had to put into the report so that when it came time to do the report, she just pulled up her file and she had all the information in it. Again, way less spoons, way less stress, better functioning at work all around. Um, so again, if there's especially a repetitive task, those make wonderful things to try to create habits around. Um, so again, think of things not in terms of novel situations with multiple personalities, um, but what are things that you see coming? What are things that you know would help you? And let's look at creating some healthy habits uh, so that we can help shift from the calm, uh, shift from all the chaos uh, to calm. So when you went back to things that aren't working well with you, um, maybe think about one easy, easy task that you would like to put on autopilot. Uh, and again, many people tend to think about the biggest task they could or something that's causing them the most stress. But again, if you're gonna be practicing setting up a habit, let's pick a really easy one, a task that you're likely to be successful at least 80% of the time if you paid attention to it. And if you can make it even smaller than that and easier than that, go for that too. Uh, because once you become successful at developing and maintaining a habit, it becomes a habit to create habits. So it's sort of a nice self-fulfilling cycle. So again, you already identified, hopefully, two things that create some chaos and are very spoon cost for you. Um, so let's see if we could maybe make one of those something to become a habit with. So in coaching, we talk a lot about strategies, structures, and supports uh, to help people stay on track. So the first thing would be, what are some of the current barriers to your success? What stops you from doing something? Like suppose it's exercising. Are you stopped because you didn't put any time up front for it? Are you stopped because you don't have any clean gym clothes? Are you stopped um, because you don't know when the classes are that you wanna go to? Um, so again, think about what are current barriers that are stopping you. And it could even be that you just don't wanna do it. Um, and that's okay too, that's a barrier as well. And then what could you change in your environment that could help you be successful? Um, you know, could you make it easier to do what you wanna do? And then when you think back about those two things that you've done that you are successful with, what can you borrow from that? What learnings can you take away to make you successful in this area? So for instance, suppose you wanna eat more fruit. Um, a barrier could be you have bags of chips and cookies on the counter and your fruit is hidden in the very back of a drawer in your refrigerator. Um, so again, that's a barrier that doesn't make it easy to do what you wanted to do. So flip that and make it easy to do the desired behavior. You know, maybe have the chips packed up in a box on the top of a pantry that's shut and then may put the fruit in a really pretty bowl right in the front of the fridge. Um, so again, I don't know what your behavior is that you'd like to work on, um, but think of a way to make it as easy as possible for you to do what's desired um, and not sabotage yourself. In 
creating a habit, there's a process called habit stacking. And that's where if you perform a desired task before a task that's already automated, you're more likely to be successful. Um, so let me repeat that because this one's really important. So if you perform the desired task before a task that you already do automatically, you're going to be more successful in doing it. So let's take coffee in the morning. So if you always make coffee in the morning, what if you prepped your dinner while the coffee's brewing and you only drink your coffee after the basic prep is done? Um, or what if you make lunches, you know, while the coffee is going? So again, if making coffee is always part of your morning routine, you can add a behavior in front of it um, with habit stacking. It could be exercise. Some people do push-ups while they wait for their coffee or they make their bed. Supposedly, if you make your bed every day, it's supposed to help set your bed up and they've done some studies that it makes you more organized and more effective. Uh, I fluctuate on bed making, we'll see. Uh, but again, for you, that might be, again, it's a big piece of real estate in your house. And if it's tidy, that could be a habit um, that makes you feel really good. Uh, again, very simple, very quick. It takes about two minutes to make your bed. Um, you could do that while your coffee's cooking. Um, habit stacking is based on classical conditioning. In psychology, we talk about Pavlov and a dog. Um, that was our basic uh, psychology um, example. And in this study, um, the dogs learn to salivate when presented with um, a metronome. So again, salivating dogs, anytime they see food is automatic. They always salivate when there's food. Don't have to teach them, don't have to reward them, don't have to pay any attention to them, automatic. But in this behavior, they did a ticking metronome, which by itself did absolutely nothing, but it was always paired with food. And what happened is these two things became linked together so that eventually, over time, practicing this behavior, the dogs automatically salivated when they heard the metronome because in their mind, these things had become linked or in our case, habit stacked. So this is gonna be an opportunity for you um, to also reward yourself. Many individuals I work with are so tough on themselves. Um, they're always critical of what they haven't done. Um, but again, if you're gonna try to create and maintain a habit, um, think of a way to pat yourself on the back and say, job well done. It could be a check mark on a calendar. It could be stars. It could be a notebook that you keep. Um, there's a number of apps right now too that you can use. Um, they have all sorts of star charts and different kinds of things. It could be stickers. Um, but again, come up with some way to track your success. It's also important to have visual cues in place uh, to help you remember what you wanna do. Again, this could be your gym clothes, it could be fruit, um, it could be putting your toothbrush by your coffee pot so you can remember to brush your teeth or heaven forbid the dreaded flossing. Uh, you can put your flosser right there too. Um, but again, if you see it, you're more likely to pay attention to it. Um, you know, and what if you used an auditory cue like your phone, you know, if you set a timer and then you knew that that was a reminder to do whatever it is you wanted to do. Some people use pictures, um, again, but come up with some kind of cueing system to help hold your desired habit in front of you. Um, and again, come up with some kind of reward. You can pay yourself money if you want. You can give stickers. Um, what are you gonna to do to keep this behavior? Because we know that behaviors are more likely to occur when rewarded. So it's gonna be important, especially if it's something that you'd rather not do. Um, like there's no inherent value, say in flossing your teeth that you get all excited about and go, yippee, I floss my teeth. Um, 
But again, what if you gave yourself money to go to Starbucks once a week, if you flossed your teeth this many times in a row? Or what if you put a copy of your dentist bill um, up on your refrigerator to remind you of how much it could cost you if you don't floss your teeth? Um, but again, play with what could work to motivate you um, and keep in mind. And it could even be using a spoon. You know, if you think about spoons and that means something to you, you know, maybe think about the fact that it'll cost you less spoons if you can automate this behavior. So now in terms of numbers, we can generally add up to three new behaviors in a chain in front of an already existing behavior or habit. Not at all one time though, um, many people jump head in. Um, but again, one at a time, you can usually add three behaviors. So if we stick with coffee, for instance, um, you can add three new behaviors in front of making coffee to automate it, um, which gets to be quite exciting. Now, it also used to say that it took 21 days to become a habit. There's some new information now that suggests it may take up to 90 days for something to become a habit. So be patient. Habits require a lot of repetition. Um, don't give up on it. Uh, it's coming. <laughs> So you have to pick a time and a place to start that optimizes your chance of success. So um, the author of uh, Atomic Habits says that one of the best ways to start a new habit is actually while you're on vacation and away from home where all your cues and routines were already scrambled. Um, because what he says is that we tend to do things and we're cued by things in our environment. So we tend to fall pretty quickly back into our old behaviors. But when you're on vacation or if your kids are home from the, you know, on vacation and things are different, um, different might be a great time uh, to start a new behavior. Uh, so again, pick a time that you'd like to really focus on change, um, that you can devote some energy to it. Because again, you wanna start successful. Now, um, I know we're talking about success, but I do wanna talk about setbacks too. Uh, because it's unreasonable to think that you're going to pick a habit and be successful 100% of the time. Um, and if you are that kind of person, please send me some info on how you did it. Because most people I know uh, make three or four steps forward, one back. You know, seven steps forward, one back. Um, so again, but it's important to plan for the setbacks. Um, just like the person in the business report once a month, we know setbacks are going to come. So let's plan for setbacks so they don't surprise us and we don't beat ourselves up and say how miserable and we're never gonna be effective because we failed. Um, so let's build in a plan uh, to deal with setbacks. The first part would be to not expect 100%. Um, again, many individuals I work with would love to be perfect and they feel like they're a failure if they're not perfect. So let's get that 100% crossed out. Uh, so I want you to plan when a setback hits, what you're going to do, not if a setback hits. A setback will occur. It's inevitable and it's okay. You don't need to be successful 100% of the time to be successful. Uh, you need to stick with it. So again, backup planning is great. Um, you know, and evaluating it. Sometimes we do autopsies on what didn't go well. Um, you know, do you need to change something up in your environment? Do you need to wake up earlier if you're really going to try to do some of this stuff? Uh, do you need to develop a special box to put stuff in when you first come home for your landing pad that makes sense for you? Uh, you know, do you need to give up an activity that you currently do to free up more time for something you want to do? Um, Whatever it is, evaluate it without beating yourself up and try again. You know, and maybe you have a friend who can be inspirational and encourage you. Maybe you have a quote that you really draw a lot of support from. Um, but figure out a way to pick yourself up and go forward. I had one client, he liked the tub pumping song. Uh, you know, and it sort of goes, you know, I get knocked down, but I get up again. And that was his motivation. You know, he would play the tub thumping song and he would get back up again. So basically, if you're looking at habits, it's going to be a numbers game. The more you do a habit, the easier it's going to become 
until finally it'll be automatic, requiring almost no additional attention and effort. And it'll be automated and it'll cost you less spoons. Um, it could be that you might actually need some additional support to help maintain these behaviors or develop them. Again, there's a number of professionals. I would highly suggest that you use somebody with knowledge of ADHD um, because ADHD is unique brain wiring and some of the old traditional recommendations might not be best for you. Um, so again, this would be something where you could get some short-term focused help getting back on track. Um, and it can be done. You know, if you think back about when you first learned to drive, um, that was hard. There were a lot of things you had to pay attention to. And now most of us drive automatically uh, for big parts of the time. We don't have to think about every step. So in the beginning, driving took a lot of spoons. Now, not so much, it's more automatic. Um, so again, if you're working on habits, looking at habits, um, think about decreasing your spoon cost because your spoons are valuable because you don't have as many as everybody else gets and things cost more. Um, so that's my take on habits. Um, so again, the summary, um, we talked about selecting something easy, keep the benefit in mind, set yourself up for success, try adding the new desired behavior in front of something you already do. Please reward yourself, track it, because what we pay attention to tends to grow. Have your plan ready to get back on track. Keep repeating it until it becomes a habit, however long it takes, and get some help if uh, you're having a difficult time. Um, so again, the quality of our lives is often a reflection of our habits. You know, whether it's making money, living healthy, um, habits are a really important piece. So I guess now we're gonna go to some questions. Yes, thank you so much for that, Michelle. I've got quite a few, so I will dive right in. Um, here, one um, listener asked, I want to change everything all at once, meal planning, <laughs> working out, et cetera. How do I start? How much do I tackle to get started? Uh, I love that about most people. Um, however, please don't do it all. <laughs> um, so again, if we go back to start with what you think is the absolute easiest thing you can change and do that first. Uh, because again, what happens is if you dive enthusiastically into everything all at once, um, you're likely to fail. So I would pick the easiest thing that you're almost guaranteed success with and get that one pretty stable and then build from there. So easiest, smallest first. Um, and I love that enthusiasm. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, for the, for the meal planning example, would a small step be like, um, picking a, a, as you said, a reliable weekly menu, like um, yeah. Mondays are always taco or I guess tacos are Tuesday, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, absolutely. Um, in fact, I know with ADHD, people get bored to tears, um, but what if just for one month, you know, every Monday you were going to have meatloaf. Every Tuesday you were going to have tacos. Every Wednesday you were going to eat out Chinese. Every Friday you were going to eat out pizza. Um, you know, and then one day could be a wing it day. Um, you know, and figure it out. But yeah, look at your meals and automate them so that you go forward. In fact, I've had a task where I had a lot of clients write down what they tend to cook because they had told me, oh, I could never cook the same thing. I said, well, just keep track of what you make for the next two weeks. And it turned out they made a lot of like chicken nuggets and fries and whatever. And they say, oh, I do do a lot of the same things. Um, but again, with ADHD, you must add a creative element or else people will die. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. And that actually gets to another uh, question that we got that I thought was so interesting. Um, how should we encourage habit formation and prepare or train for cognitive flexibility simultaneously? Um, for the, they have to be a little bit different. Um, so say you want to brush your teeth. So that needs to become the habit. But for flexibility, maybe you could play different music while you brushed your teeth because the song's actually three minutes. Um, and you're supposed to brush your teeth at least two minutes. So, you know, you could have a different playlist and you could do a different song every time you were brushing your teeth. 
or you could do get some of your steps in while you're brushing your teeth. So again, if you keep the habit the same, but maybe do some different things around it. Um, I know people with ADHD love to be flexible and love to be creative. Um, but again, the more habits you make, the more spoons you'll have to be creative in so many other areas of your life. Right, right. There are trade-offs, absolutely. There are trade-offs. <laughs> <laughs> um, this was a, another kind of deeper one, but um, why are good habits like exercise so easy to quit, but bad habits like snack foods are so easy to maintain? <laughs> I don't know, but that is so true. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, part of it is TV and advertising. Uh, they spend so much energy thinking of ways to make us addicted to foods um, or even TV shows. You know, they always leave you with the cliffhangers at the end where you say, like on Netflix, I'm only going to watch this one show. But then they leave you with this cliffhanger at the end. It's like, OK, I'm just going to see what they do with this. Um, so, again, we have really important people working really hard against us <laughs> to come up with ways to maintain some of our bad behaviors because they make other people a lot of money. Um, but so that's an important part, though, is how do we make exercising, say, uh, more valuable? Um, you know, and again, some people put up their uh, blood test scores and they keep it right with their gym stuff. You know, if you have high cholesterol or if you're in the obese category or whatever it is, um, that's why it's going to be really important to hold the why in front of you. Um, because if you don't have a strong why, it's really easy to let things go and to slip into some old behaviors. Right. Um, and this leads into a, another question we got quite commonly, which is about motivation. So, you know, just as, um, goodness with, I think with exercise to me, it's like the long term and short term, right? So it takes longer to probably get to your goal weight. You don't have the immediate gratification of, um, of the exercise. So a lot of people are asking, how do we maintain motivation for these habits that have long term benefits, but short term mm, frustrations or, uh, harder to, recognize benefits. <laughs> okay. So one tip would be break it up into really small steps. So instead of waiting until you're at your goal weight, which, you know, could be a while, um, you know, come up with, you want to lose two pounds and then celebrate the two pounds because that is huge and that is beneficial. So if you look at, say you have to lose 20 pounds or 30 pounds, you know, that can be dawning. It's sort of like when you ask uh, people who climb mountains, how do you do it? They say, I look for the next step. You know, if they looked at the whole mountain, it would be really hard to go. But it's like, I just look for the next step. So have a small visual in mind for just your next step and have a reward there. Um, what's the reward going to be um, for the small step? And again, people with ADHD are so hard on themselves. Um, again, they set these really lofty goals and then they beat themselves up for not hitting it. Um, so again, small, small steps. And that Atomic Habits talks about the importance of small. Um, so small, small things, frequent rewards um, for doing those small accomplishments instead of waiting for the big ones. Yes. Um, have you found any apps that are helpful or other tools that are helpful with these rewards along the way? Yes. Awesome. Now, now you're going to ask, what are they, right? <laughs> <laughs> How do you know? Um, and I don't remember the names right now, but I know if you go to the, I think something's called my chart. Actually, I think I wrote an article in Attitude Magazine on uh, apps that are helpful. Um, it's probably in there too. Um, so maybe that's online now. Um, but again, I think there's something about like my chart or whatever, but if you look on the apps for things about rewards and charting, there are a number of apps that are quite good, um, that can help you keep track. And one of them I remember had stars on it. Uh, and then there was another one. Oh, I love this one. There was one called nag me. And, uh, if you didn't do what you were supposed to do, 
they would uh, keep on telling you that you needed to do it. And some of the people even had their mom's voices on there, nagging them to do stuff if they didn't do it. And it wouldn't stop until you either turned it off or did the behavior. Um, so I don't know the names of these right now, um, but again, if you do a search, they, they're, they're getting to be quite plentiful now. Um, and I know I did an attitude article on apps too. Uh, so maybe will. we can get them some pieces on there. Absolutely. So we will add those to the resources section of the um, the webinar landing page for those of you who are who are listening. If you go back to the landing page at the bottom, um, we'll add a resources section and we'll we'll dig up um, mm -hmm. those articles because I, I think we ha we actually have um, one or two. Um, so that'll be helpful. Um, okay. So this um, we have a, a number of questions about both. Um, motivating the other people in your life, uh, to build healthy habits. <laughs> um, and those were, um, both spouses and children, primarily, um, teenagers. So do you have any advice for, um, sort of impressing upon them, uh, this like spoon concept and the importance of, of building habits as a, as a lifelong, you know, way to, not only productivity, but, but happiness. Um, okay. So kids are hard, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but again, maybe having them listen to something like this. Um, there's also some nice books like the seven habits of highly effective people or the habits of rich people. Uh, so there's a number of books that talk about the benefit of the habits. So what you'll find is for a lot of successful people, they do have similar habits. Um, a lot of them get up first thing and exercise. That tends to be a habit of a lot of really rich, successful people. Um, a lot of people streamline their life. Um, oh, I think it was Steve Jobs always wore black, so he didn't have to think about what he was going to wear because that took up some mental energy he didn't want to waste on other things. Um, so he sort of streamlined that. So they tend to streamline things that require energy, spoon cost, um, you know, and sort of take them off their plates. Um, but you may reach them with things like the seven habits of highly effective people. And I believe I could be wrong, but I think there's a version for teens uh, that they did on that too. Um, so again, I think the importance would be to have a conversation and maybe even, you know, do the, I noticed you can't say you're messing up, you're doing this, you should do that. Although you want to, and you're right. Um, but you need to word it. Like I notice that in the mornings there tends to be a lot of chaos for you and a lot of stress for you around finding where you put things. You know, I wonder if we could take a few minutes and problem solve. So like for some of the kids, and again, in counseling, when I work with them, it'd be, you know, you're always going to need your football equipment. And yet it seems like it's never where you need it to be when you go running out the door. You know, let's think about, is there a way that we could collect it all so that you didn't have to go all around the house finding it. And, you know, some of the people said, well, let's just come up with a bag and then I can just grab the bag and go. And, you know, we might put a hook up in the mudroom or something for the bag, or we might put the bag at the end of the closet. Um, so again, uh, if you use language, like I noticed that this is, you know, causing you a lot of stress, you know, I'm wondering, because again, actually looking for your stuff all over the place is actually a habit. It's not a good habit, <laughs> but it's a habit. So we can change that and make it a different habit uh, that again would be much easier for them. Um, or you can take them to a counselor or a coach and let the counselor do it if you're not successful. Um, so again, um, but I think talking about habits, maybe listening to this webinar, um, helping them come up with, you know, one area of their life that maybe they could automate that would make things easier for them, but showing them the value. Uh, and again, there's a lot of articles on the habits of rich people um, and again, so habits are getting to be quite popular. Yes, indeed. A number of people here are, um, recommending, um, recommending some books, one of the atomic habits, one that yes. you mentioned, and I'm trying to find, uh, the other one that had habits in the title. We'll add that to the resources section <laughs> as well. Lots of questions coming in. So I'm doing my best to, um, to organize and keep them in. And someone here recommended task tree as a good app. Um, and a number of people saying that they, they have noticed that they do best with a deadline 
and or some kind of um, competition or something to keep them, um, oh gosh, you know, some someone or something to kind of keep them honest, um, which is what a lot of apps do offer. Um, as you said, those kind of nagging reminders can act as a deadline and accountability could be, um, some of them offer groups, um, and like leaderboards and things like that for competition. So, well, see attitude maybe could start their own little group. (laughs) An accountability group. Yeah. For habits, you know, who wants to try to change a habit? (laughs) That's not a bad idea. All right, everybody. Tell us if you're interested in the habit yeah, forming you, accountability group. Yeah. And then people can just check in with how they're doing. And uh, I don't know, you do a lot of different forums and groups. <laughs> yes. Yeah. The, uh, well, it, the accountability tends to be um, pretty, we found universally attractive um, and effective, um, you know, that peer pressure harnessed in a, in a good way. Um, Yeah. And actually for um, a lot of things, you know, if you had a body double, somebody who sort of sits over you and make sure you do it. um, We've used that pretty effectively in coaching a lot. And uh, it could even be a virtual body double. So sometimes for some of the clients I work with, I just send them texts, you know, it's like, Hey, on task (laughs) or how the flossing go. Or sometimes I just send a question mark, depending on what they wanted. Ah. Um, You know, so again, you might find somebody else to partner with who can just send you whatever word you want or whatever cue you want. And then ahead of time, you know, do they just want a thumbs up? Because sometimes that's all I do for some of the people I work with is I give them thumbs up if they did it. And if not, it's like, um, do you need to change something or just try again? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, they could partner up and come up with somebody who will be an accountability piece, but yeah, accountability is, uh, is good for habits. Okay. Yeah. We had a a one, at least one question here, um, from someone asking how they have friends who want to help, but don't know how to. So that would be an excellent way to harness the help of friends, even if they don't live nearby. Absolutely. And it's important, though, that they do it the way you want them to do it, not the way they think they should do it. Because, mm. again, your help isn't help if it's not helping. Right. Um, and many people will do what they think you need or what would work for them, and they don't ask what you want. So the critical caveat would be tell them what you want. Because I have some clients who said, you know, I want you to send me a note. I have some clients who will say, I just want you to send me a question mark. I have some who say, if you haven't heard from me at the end of the week, let's talk about it. Um, So again, as a coach, I do what they want. um, Because again, that's what they think will be effective. And then we evaluate if that's working or not. Mm -hmm. Interesting. We have a number of people saying that they um, have worked with uh, coaches, either ADHD coaches or life coaches, and others who have had a lot of success with um, their recovery groups and, um, and apps. Someone mentioned, um, sober time, which I've, I've heard of mm. before. Um, and so perhaps there are some solutions and places that we wouldn't normally think to look that could be very right. effective. Yeah. So people, please keep on sending what you know, mm. <laughs> we mm-hmm. always learn from each other. So any apps that you found successful in the past, please share those, any kind of activities you found to help keep you on track. Please share, because again, everybody knows something. If we put it together, we uh, expand the pool of knowledge. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, always better to have people who, uh, with similar perspectives, test drive these things and <laughs> tell you what works. Um, I did see here this one question that hit close to home. I'm a working mom of four kids under the age of six. How do I develop better house cleaning routines? I feel like I never have time and the evenings are a nightmare for me with dinner, bedtime routines. Four kids under six. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So one is going to be to adjust your expectations. Um, that for anybody that has four kids under six, um, you're going to need to lower your standards for a bit. Um, But you also might want to start having the kids help too. You know, what is it that the kids can actually do? Because I know I have a grandson who just turned five and he does a pretty good, darn good job of cleaning up, you know, picking up his toys. 
and stuff and he can actually help load the dishwasher. So again, just because they're little doesn't mean they can't do some things. And if you start to train them early, that'll help. And you might be one of somebody who might want to automate some of the meals, you know, like cook a big batch of chili and have enough for like four different dinners, you know, if you just cook once. Um, so, you know, coming up with some time savers, um, you know, but think about what you could make um, bartering with people. You know, there might be something like maybe somebody could watch your kids while you do meal prep and clean, and then you can watch their kids while they clean. Because, um, again, if you have four kids, if you add two more, it probably wouldn't be that much worse. And then you could get your thing done and then they could get their things done. Um, it could be that you could, you know, if you have a partner, ask them to give you some dedicated time. Um, and you might even want to give them a choice. Would you rather watch the kids or would you rather mop the floor? Um, if you have money, this might be a way to buy yourself out, you know, buy yourself some time. Uh, there's a lot of high school kids, college kids that do a lot of activities, whether it's helping to watch your kids, helping to pick up your house. Um, you know, this might be something that you treat yourself with because you're not always going to have kids under under the age of six. So your life will get better. Um, but right now, that's a difficult situation. So I think this is another one. Be kind to yourself. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Someone said, I have a TikTok to share with the mom. <laughs> 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 Uh, uh, there was actually a cute cartoon I saw that's mine. Uh, the husband came in in the cartoon and uh, the, the kids were outside. They were naked. There was stuff all over the place, broken toys. The house was like disaster. Food was all over the place. And then he went upstairs and saw the, the mom and he said, what's wrong? He says, you know, you ask me what I do all day. Today, I didn't do it. Mm, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, that is um, illuminating, isn't it? Um, <laughs> um Yes, yeah, some people are asking where. So uh, the attitude editors, we will we will collect from the comments your various um, recommendations, apps, and books, and other, um, and we will add them to the the webinar uh, landing page. Um, so you'll give us a, give us a little time. We'll we'll pull that together though, and then um, you can visit it and click away and see what works for you. And we'll add our other resources as well. Yeah, and then I'll yes. see if I can pull some of them up and send them to you to add to. Perfect. Um, and maybe we'll, we'll create a whole article out of it. Um, okay. So we are, um, I'm running a little over since we started, um, a bit late. Um, but let's see, um, I'm looking at other, other big questions here. A lot of people interested in accountability. Um, <laughs> so, uh, kind of another, let's take a step back, big picture question. You mentioned, um, three behavior with the habit stacking, um, that you can kind of build three new behaviors before an existing habit. But people sure. are wondering, okay, so what's a reasonable goal for, um, for each of those new behaviors. You, you can't do all three at once, we assume, but how long do you give yourself um, building in one, one behavior before you try to add another? Okay. In theory, you're supposed to wait until it becomes automatic. So it could be 90 days. It could be. Um, could be. Or you could be well on your way in even two weeks. Mm -hmm. So whenever it's not costing you a lot of spoons to do it, um, however long that is. So once you're doing it pretty routinely, it's not something you have to think about. It doesn't cost you very many spoons. Then you can add the next one. Um, so you don't always have to wait 21 to 90 days, especially if you're doing small, small, small behaviors. Right, right. And it's very personal and also dependent on just how small your, your new behavior or big, right. your new behavior right. is. Yeah. So when it doesn't cost you too many spoons, it's time to move on. Okay, perfect. Um, great. And I think I'll just try to get maybe one more in here. Um, and that is, uh, okay. With, um, says, Oh, Sorry, I'm trying to find you know, it. It's hard to read and talk <laughs> at the same time. Um, 
uh, people wondering about um, to-do lists that they get. They, they're wondering about the interplay with habits and to-do lists. Um, is, is our end goal to take these items off a, a to-do list and make them just so routine that we then can free up that mental energy? A lot of people just get overwhelmed. overwhelmed. Okay. Yes, that's the whole goal. Yeah. It's just going to be something you do without even thinking about it. Good, good. Okay, so fewer to-do list items, everyone. That is our end goal, which I think we can all embrace. And um, you'll just do it automatically. Some people, instead of automatically, switch it to automatically. Automatically. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, okay, well, we have um, all learned so much today. Thank you, Michelle, for this um, really illuminating presentation on habits. We have a lot of good next steps and we will share those resources but for now thank you so much for your time and your insights and thank you to everyone who joined us and and stuck around um through our technical difficulties i did want to point out we have a um free free webinars every week and our next one is on um july 8th uh, with uh, thomas brown phd and ryan kennedy it's all about inattentive adhd why it's misdiagnosed and the best ways to treat it. So it should be very interesting. So thank you for joining us today. Um, we hope you will support Attitude and come back again soon.